Hello everyone and welcome to The Green Flame, the deep green resistance broadcast that brings you radical analysis, practical skills, and artistic expression from the revolutionary movement to defend the planet and rebuild just human communities. I am your host and comrade Max Wilbert. On this episode of The Green Flame, we interviewed Ja. Ja is a community organizer, filmmaker, and podcast host living with the land in the Philippine archipelago. Ja, it's great to have you here on the Green Flame. I'm so happy that that you're able to make time for this interview. Could you take a few minutes and introduce yourself and your work to our audience? Yeah, sure. Uh, but first of all, thank you so much, Jennifer, for inviting me in this podcast. Hello, everyone. My name is Ja. Uh, I am I am from Archipelago. I am um, a community organizer for almost a decade. I am part of some outdoor groups and what we do is we uh organize activities we organize we are a non-oppressive groups that organize communities and promote the idea of, of uh, community defense and non-violence direct action so at the same time i'm also uh, working on my space i'm running an autonom- autonomous space i called pirate studio i am a filmmaker i produce uh short documentaries about our lo- local actions here I'm also hosting different podcasts to be uh, radical consciousness, uh, bring awareness, and to promote those uh, campaigns or advocacies of different networks. Uh, I have a community library, which is part of my space, which is a part of this, this local autonomous space. And uh, we also conduct different activities here, do free workshops as part of our actions uh, to promote uh, the culture of sharing, because sharing is not all about giving uh, food mat- materials, but it's all about um, providing information and skills that will be helpful to the communities. This space also hosting uh, different discussions, especially uh, in the uh, topic of ecology. Yeah, that's it for now, Jennifer. That's fascinating. What kind of workshops do you have in your space? Personally, I give basic video editing, basic guitar lessons, and um, different ethnic instruments, uh, basic uh, urban gardening, and uh, other networks who came on, on, on my space. I encourage them to do you know workshops. So some individuals share crochet workshop, the herbal uh, workshop, zine workshop. Some networks doing that. But uh, I didn't have the chance to do that on my space. But in other actions, uh, we're doing that, and other workshops that might be helpful to the community. So that's what uh, what we're doing right now. Thank you for sharing that. I was you're just, welcome, Jennifer. The the first time when Max came over, the the green flame that happened then went way into the history of the Philippines. And I wanted to ask you kind of a a question about the origin of that word and where it comes from, and. I also have heard archipelago or Filipina archipelago. What do you like to call the place where you live on earth? Okay, that is a very good question. And thank you so much for asking that question, Jennifer. So I am comfortable this place to be called archipelago. Maybe that is the most simplest and safest way to identify this country because archipelago archipelago means a group of island. And I am not, I will not allow or I am not comfortable that this country will be called Philippines because that word is coming from King Philip II of Spain who colonized the Philippines. The word Philippine is coming from a colonizer, which is the king, king of Spain. The Philippine was uh, colonized way back 1521. It's a basic thing that we should not allow or 
you should not allow your your country to be called to uh, to people that colonized and killed a lot of people on your community. So that is the main reason why I prepared uh, this country to be called Archipelago and not Philippines. What's going on right now? Has it changed since Max visited um, last March? Is there a change in the political situation? So the political situation since Max visited uh, last year, well, um, really changed a lot, but in a worse way. Because uh, the main reason why Max uh, need to go back earlier is because of the lockdown that will happen at that last year. And that's due to the pandemic. And right now, we're stuck on the same situation. We are still on the uh, community quarantine right now. I can say that the current government or the current regime take advantage of the situation and they're using this pandemic to advance their political agendas because this government taking this pandemic as as a peace and order issue and not a health issue because way back 2020 what did what did they uh, they did is they sent police they sent militaries uh, in communities and at the same time every community don't need police and militaries what they need is a food security a lot of people have been un- unemployed because of that situation. And because they are unemployed, a lot of working class was struggling in the everyday life. Because this working class, they didn't have the chance to save money because what they're earning is not enough for their daily expenses. So a lot of people said that y- you should save money, you should uh, buy your stuff. But the thing is, They should understand that those working class, they didn't have the opportunity or they didn't have the uh, chance to do that, to to buy and stock food because they didn't have the chance to save money because the the living wage is just around, I think, 500 pesos. That is for Manila rate. And for the provincial rate, it's just around 400 pesos. So can you imagine that's 500 pesos is only, um, that is around nine bucks for eight eight hours per day okay so you and you need to add the transportation so if you are from Cavite or you're coming from the nearby province of Metro Manila then you need to add uh, two hours for your travel and then for going back at home you need to add a, another you know two hours so overall a simple worker is spending 12 hours per day just to earn that uh, nine to ten bucks at the same time, the thing is, having a decent house, education, health become privilege, okay? Because those in those uh, key industries was uh, on the hand by the uh, corporations. It was privatized. So if you don't have, if if you if you if you if you've been sick, then you need to pay. If you're if you're hungry, you need to pay you, you, just to get a food. So that is the main reason why. A lot of people are still in the line of poverty because of that setup. And then pandemic uh, came in. The government addressed that this is a serious issue of the, of the year. And what they did is instead of sending uh, food, uh, medicines, what they did is they sent uh, military police and they intimidate people that you should follow the government to stay at home. Okay, don't, don't go outside the house. So that way we can fight the COVID-19. And I think that's insane and still happening right now. So as, as you can see, if you will check what, what is the activity during the middle of the pandemic, the government take this, that's a, this is a good time for them to advance their political agendas. So can you imagine during the pandemic, the still mining corporations are still operating in Archipelago, in different parts of Archipelago. Okay, I think. This pandemic we're currently experiencing is in favor with the, the current regime and, of course, of course, of those uh, investors or corporations on their side. And uh, this regime is trying to establish that they are progressive, they are aggressive. But the truth is, they are just the same with the recent administration. Maybe um, they have different face, but they are on the same coin. They are here to protect those corporations and oligarchs who's running business that has a big participation in directly raping our natural resources. And this there's the main reason why there's a shortage when it comes to food supply. 
I don't believe that there is scarcity right now because archipelago we have we, we are very rich when it comes to natural resources. So I can say that there there is uh, scarcity, but I think the problem is someone controlled the natural resources and it was protected by the state. Okay, and um, this government have the program which they call build 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 or the BBB program. So what is BBB? You know, it, it is the centerpiece program of, of the Duterte administration that aims to usher the golden age of its infrastructure in the Philippines. So this will cost around eight trillion to nine trillion from 2016 up to 2020 to address the huge infrastructure uh, backlog in the country. So one of their one of the program under this build, build, build is the Manila Rehabilitation Program. So the Manila Bay Rehabilitation Program. So the aim of this project is to make Manila Bay to be more presentable to the people. So what they did is they put tons of artificial white sand on the bay. What? And yeah, artificial so, white sand. So for who? Certainly that not it, for the benefit of the living world at all. Is this some kind of a shiny presentation to, yeah, to attract people and to attract um, investor? Oh. That's why they want to rehabilitate the Manila Bay. So what they did is they put tons of white sand on that bay at a specific area, but until now, you know, they are not finished since last year. So the question is, Jennifer, what is this sand? This sand is. They called it dolomite. So it is composed. Some some experts said that dolomite is not good for the health because it, it can cause cancer. Yeah. But of course, uh, the administration said, and even the head of the Department of uh, Natural Resources say that it's totally fine because it was really fine. But the question is, where did they get this dolomite sand? <laughs> well, this dolomite <laughs> is coming from a mining site in Cebu area. Is there mm-hmm. any ability to, to push back against that? Does anybody have any say there about them doing this? Or is this just the you know, capitalism making more money because they can? <laughs> that is right. That's why that pro- that project has been criticized by, by many people, but still many people you know, support the program because they will argue that the recent administration didn't do this. They, they didn't have the initiative to clean the Manila Bay. But the truth is, if we will analyze what is happening, that dolomite sand is coming from Cebu, from some part of, of Cebu, which is part of the Visayas region of the archipelago, in the middle part of archipelago. And the bad thing is, the sad thing is, uh, I saw on the news that Dolo- this, the dolomite mining badly affect the, the nearest bay of the mining site. And, okay, and on the news, it said that the coral reefs of Cebu has been destroyed by crashed dolomite. It badly damaged the marine ecosystem on that specific area. So what is the sense of doing the rehabilitation of Manila Bay if those materials that make Manila Bay good again was, was coming from a destruct- destructive process and badly affect the community and the surroundings of that materials where they, they, where they get it? The question is, who really benefits for this project? Can we say it is? Can we say it's for the people? <clears throat> but maybe not, because uh, what I saw in that scenario is the contractor, the estate agent of the project, only benefits on that project, <clears throat> and still many people supporting this project and appreciate it because maybe they are stuck up in the idea that they want to experience Manila Bay become a beautiful place again. Well, in fact, we don't need to have a white sand to make that area become beautiful in our eyes but what we need to do is to stop first the water pollution coming from thousand households who's using their sink every day okay there, there is a big scam and people should know there is a big scam that is happening since 2002 from the concessionaires Manila and Manila Water Manila, Manila and Manila Water they are the, the water conces, uh, concessionaire here in, in the archipelago so take note 20% of the bill, total bill we pay every month, go to the reforestation project, which is the, in the Angat Dam and the Ipu Dam in the watershed of Sierra Madre, just in Bulacan. And then 
uh, the remaining uh, 20% coming from the total bay that we pay is go to the sewerage uh, system. So what is the sewerage system? This is a pipe that they should connect in every sink of every household. So in that way, before they dump, you know, the, the used water, it should go first to the treatment center. And at the same time, uh, once they treat the water, that will be the time that they will dump it to the ditch, which is connected to the river. But since 2012, there are no single pipe they put in a household. So can you imagine thousands of households using their sink every day, every minute, and those wastewater was directly dumped to ditch, which is connected to the Pasig River, and this river is connected to the Manila Bay. So how will you clean you know, this Manila Bay if thousands of sinks, if thousands of households using their sink every day and this water pollution coming from, the, from every household of Metro Manila? So I think that rehabilitation is useless. So even we put beautiful white sand on the Manila Bay, but if the uh, water is contaminated, then th- that is useless. Yeah, yeah, that's why if you are in front of Manila Bay, you can you, you can smell you know, those <laughs> those uh, you know, the smell that might not good to, to to you, but that is the reason why it's still happening there. You know, on that scenario, you can see there is a corruption that's happening by Manila that, that that was happened, and it is the Manila and the Manila Water is the concessionaire. I know that this administration critic this you know two corporation. That's, that, that is not enough because until now, nothing's happened. That's such a contradiction. You know, you whitewash the beach, you destroy another bay, and you don't address the direct problem because what's beautiful is more and more life in the bay. Exactly. I can't, I can't imagine how hurt and how injured and how wounded that bay is now. Is there anything in Manel Bay that's alive well, right now? Probably there are still, uh, Manila Bay is close to people because they are still. It is still under construction by the DPWH, the Department of uh, Highway, who's currently working on that uh, project. That is one of the main problems, why Manila Bay, Manila Bay looks a dead place for organism. So that's why I kind of see the logic that why this government invests white sand is to make Manila Bay become beautiful in the eyes of the people. To be honest, you know, they spend for the Manila Bay rehabilitation is around 389 million. Okay. So okay. can you imagine that, you know, especially on the first quarter of pandemic, people are struggling. And I cannot imagine that the government prioritized this type of project instead of providing those funds in med- in medicine, you know, in food. Um, hunger is one of the highest form of violence. Mm-hmm. I can say that. And until now, many of the people here are, are in the poverty line because the main uh, uh, concern, the main, uh, the, the, the priority of the state is to advance or to push these uh, projects until the, under the build, build build program. And if we will analyze what is BBB, just like what I said from the very beginning, BBB is a centerpiece program that the administration that aims to usher, you know, the golden age of infrastructure. This idea is coming from Western countries. You can see uh, the consequences of this model is eco- ecological destruction. Okay. The main reason why Western countries like the United States, the European countries are here is because for our natural resources. We have plans uh, at, at the moment, fracking industry is not something famous uh, at our, in our country because we have a lot of steel. We have a lot of natural resources above the ground. That's why mm-hmm. mining corporations are everywhere. But uh, of course, we have one, uh, as far as I know, we have one fracking company who's working on the uh, west part of the Philippines, which is under the <clears throat> shell. Okay. But as my articulation here is as long as a country or every state, as long as their concern or main uh, agenda is to develop the country in the perspective of Western countries, well, 
it will be totally destructive to the ecology. It will not be sustainable. Uh, you know, it will never be sustainable. You know, this type of setup is more about uh, concreting the natural world. And if you don't have any land where you can create your own food, I can say that living in, under this system is not really sustainable because <clears throat> this this system, we, which is under the capitalism, and maybe the root is the idea of civilization is the main roots of those destruction, poverty, <clears throat> violence. is more about control. It's more about being the center. We we want to be the center of ecology, but the truth is not. We're just part of ecology. And maybe in this practices, okay, this practice, this luxuries we have is maybe the main pollution of, of the ecology. That's why currently we're facing ecological crisis because of these practices. But people, of course, I fully understand that it's not, it's not easy to let go of these luxuries that was injected by the system for, you know, for many years. But how we will fight this, you know? I think the best action is we need to decolonize ourselves first. We need to look back on, you know, on our ancestors. We need to look back on their practices. I'm not saying that we need to put off our dress and uh, do the same thing that they're what they're doing. But what I'm saying is we need to look back on our ancestors. We need to get wisdom practices which is really something sustainable to the community or to the land and that's why it's more about decolonization because we are injected just like from the very beginning i said uh, we've been colonized by spanish united states british japanese this different cultures uh, badly uh, affected our culture in so many aspects so that's why i think uh, if you are living archipelago, the best thing to do first is to decolonize. Because of course, maybe you will get some uh, revolutionary revolutionary theories coming from. But still, if that is coming from the West West uh, perspective, then still there is a tendency that it will not it will not fit to our context. So as long as the context, the revolutionary theory is more about developing the country, well, I think it will not be sustainable. That's why. I am more comfortable to share people that if we are part, if you're part of the uh, archipelago, if we want to change something, then we need to start the revolution on our kitchen, on ourselves. There will be no such large scale of revolution if there are no revolution that's coming from from yourself. But the same at the same time, how we're going to do that? So on my end, my practice is to uh, to appreciate the idea of decolonization. It's more about Studying the practices of our ancestors, uh, the way, the way they they communicate with their with the other organisms, with the natural world, how they live it. But it's not about doing that all thing. But it's all about what I can practice at the moment, what I can get from them. So at the same time, in that way, I can say that those practices of our ancestor is advanced rather than the uh, you know current technology because. They handle the this this earth for so many years, but in a balanced way. So I think those practices are more advanced rather than the uh, things that we practice at the moment. So this generation was doomed, not because only of of those uh, corporations, but because of our practices. So, and of course, I know. At the same time, it is really important that we need to be aware. You know, aware is really something important. Maybe that is, it will be the foundation of everything. We need to be, we need to be aware first. What's really happening on our ocean? What's happening on our forests and our mountains? So if people will be aware that bad things happen every minute in oceans, in rivers, in forests, in, in our mountains, and uh, if they will know that the natural resources was, was being raped, by those corporations for just for the sake of profit. At the same time, if there is you know a natural disasters that comes in archipelago, the first uh, people that that is badly affected is those people who is on the poverty line, and not those corporations who's directly uh, destroying our mountains. So people need to be aware about that. But of course, at the same time, if you will be aware, 
well, we need to be decisive. Self-determination is really something important. It, on, in the previous pandemic and at the moment, the best lesson that I learned is people are become comfortable if they have a stock of food, a stock of water, a stock of money on their account, and they think they can survive. But the truth is that is not sustainable. I think the best way to, to survive in this pandemic is to do the idea of, uh, or to practice the idea of mutual cooperation. Mutual cooperation is the best ingredient for a sustainable community. You've learned from the pandemic that having a little stock of this or that isn't enough, that you really need to have your community. Is, is, am I hearing that right? That is right. That you yeah. need to find each other. With the pandemic and the way the government has shut down interaction, are you still finding a way to organize and to skill share and to to move away from their control? Yes, uh, we do. To be honest, uh, last February 13th, uh, we launched the Pirate Studio here on my new place. And um, we conduct uh, food sharing directly on the street. Okay, We uh, do a free market skill sharing, film share, uh, film showing, and some brief performance for the community. So that uh, it ha- that event happened last last month. And until now, every day, we're practicing uh, sharing food here in my community, with my neighborhood. To be honest, yesterday, one of my neighborhood bring some fruits <laughs> coming from his farm. And it's, so that's the way how we live right now. That's why I, I prepare to live in a rural area rather on a city setup because uh, the last time Max visit Archipelago last year, I was living in Metro Manila. And I was living in Metro Manila since uh, 2014 until last year. But uh, last December, I decided to go to live in a rural area. So right now, I have a mini forest beside me. I have land. We can create our, our, our own food. And I can say that if Lacto will happen again and people need food, I can say that we uh, on our backyard, we have some vegetable that we can share to our neighborhood. I'm so happy for your community. You've come so far in, in just a year. Thank you so much for that. Because the thing that I want to promote is the importance of having a land. We need to protect the land. Land become freedom. If we have land, we can create our own food with the community it will be great if we were working with working with the land with our community so if we have that you can you can play on that land you can connect directly to the uh, to our land that's why land is really something important but what's happening right now is i think this generation didn't appreciate what is the importance or they didn't know what is the importance of having a land because the main perspective right now is we need to have a progress as progress for them is more about creating different jobs, creating buildings, creating those in- infrastructure which is destructive to the natural world. But at the end of the day, if pandemic like this happened, they saw that city setup was not sustainable. That's why COVID-19 is the best lesson. Having a land is the mo- most important, one of the most important element in the planet. And people need to art- uh, analyze it, to articulate that that thing. I couldn't agree with you more. Do you have any way that from afar, from literally all over the world, we can help and support the archipelago and the people of the archipelago and, and the work that you're doing? I'd love to see some of your films if you're you know, sure, if you're sure. well to be honest, this coming April twenty fifth. This coming April twenty fifth, we're going to have a discussion about civilization. I am expecting local networks who will come and we will start discussing, discussing what is the civilization? What is the, what is the meaning of civilization? And uh, we are expecting some local networks coming from uh, Visayas region who's currently fighting uh, against the road construction of the Gras National Park. They will present their current campaign and other international networks will come to to present their campaigns they're doing like Max. He will come and present a talker pass and then at the end how they will connect you know those uh issues uh, to the idea of civilization if you want to support our work you can support us by 
donating food for you know for the participants <laughs> and um what can and uh you know by supporting those uh mutual mutual aid actions by the space that we do quarterly and um you can support us if this coming September i know the website of uh, of myspace will expire again the domain so if you can help pay the domain then that's good so that way i can continue uh, the website I can share the website where you can see, you know, uh, some of my works, some of the uh, activities, uh, space activities. Yeah, that's it for now. And of course, the best thing to do is, you know, to share those uh, podcasts that we do, that I do, uh, which is the Mad Earth Podcast. So there are some different uh, topics, issues that uh, that has been uh, was available on that podcast. So uh, that's it, uh, Jennifer. Thank you. Hearing that, uh, Jennifer. But by the way, because uh, just like what it said, um, this coming twenty five, uh, Max and other networks will join. You know, this is the discussion via Zoom. But I just want to add something that the the DJR Asia Pacific mm-hmm. um, are planning to create the Asia Pacific uh, Ecological Network uh, to do activity this coming April nineteen. At 7 p.m. Manila time, uh, we uh, we had just a meeting with some local network here. Just like what I said, uh, they are the network in, in Negros Occidental who's fighting for the Negros National Park against the road construction on that area. So they will present uh, their local campaign, local concerns, local fight on that day. So our job uh, is to to facilitate activity and we will invite different networks uh, locally and internationally so that way at the end they can present their local concerns and they can they can share how how people can help them on their local uh, local fight or on that specific campaign because that is the main reason why we created the asia pacific ecological network for that is the main purpose why we do we do that last year Mm. so this coming april 19 we will do that again, and uh, the network of Negros will be the one who will present their campaign. I just want to add that there are tons you know, of mining industries in, in Archipelago, and even in this day of crisis, in the pandemic crisis, it's still the priority, the priority of uh, the state is to rape the natural resources just for the sake of profit and uh, for the idea of they called progress. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but at the yeah. same time, um, that progress they called is not sustainable. That's only for us, but even in other organisms. So, we need to articulate our situation. We need to, we need to think that this kind of setup that we have is that sustainable, and this natural resources that we have right now is not owned by us it is for the next generation and our job is to protect the remaining uh, natural resources we have right now because that is the best thing that we can do to save the planet but of course at the same time how are we going to do that well the best thing to do is to fight to fight to be decisive and i am much comfortable saying that we can do that if we will work collectively i, I just want to clarify that I'm not saying that there is one way how to, how to to solve this uh, ecological concerns or in issues or different social issues that we're facing currently. There's so much many way to fight this uh, oppressive system, to fight this dominating culture, and it's up to you to find your way. How will you fight this? This system, this dominating system that uh, raped our planet, that, that raped the humanity, that raped the other organisms. So be creative, in a case. Creative resistance is everywhere. And resistance is really something important. We don't deserve to lose this fight because we are fighting not because for, for the sake of this generation, but for the sake of the next, 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 next generation. Thank you. Really appreciate you being here and all the work that you're doing. And um, yeah, 
This is, I, <laughs> I don't know what to say. You've, you've said it all. Thank you so much for that, Jennifer. I'm so happy, you know, to be with you today. <laughs> I am so happy to be with you too. To find out more about Jaws' work as a community organizer, filmmaker, and podcast host, you can go to piratestudio.net and to S-A-M-A-L-A-H-A-T Advocacy A-D-V-O-C-A-C-Y dot org. We end this podcast with Ja playing a two-stringed ethnic instrument of the archipelago. Max Wilbert, one of the hosts of the Green Flame podcast. I want to thank you for listening to our show and let you know a few ways that you can support the Green Flame. First, you can subscribe to our platform using the podcasting system of your choice. We're listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pocket Cast, and all the rest. We're even on YouTube. Leaving us a positive review or rating on these platforms helps us reach a larger audience. You can also share these shows with your friends. If you're interested in donating to support the production of The Green Flame, please visit deepgreenresistance.org. And finally, the goal of this show is to activate people. So if you really want to support this show, start organizing in your own community. Thank you again for listening.